continuity of government and a succession plan already in place. Why would he have bothered to do that? Um, Absolutely, it's, it makes no sense whatever as far as the established protocols. Uh, President Johnson, in taking his vice presidential oath, or Johnson in taking his vice presidential oath, had already been given the authority, all the authorities he needed for succession as commander-in-chief. Uh, there's, there's just nothing from a legal standpoint that he, he gained from being signed in as president. Now, conceptually, and, and the point has been argued, that he did it for the sake of legitimacy in order to reassure the public. Uh, a counter-argument would be that he did it so that there could be no action taken to prevent him from assuming the presidency. Um, that's, that takes you into the area of suspicions, of course. Um, the third, of course, the third cut would be that Johnson so badly wanted to be president that he wanted he wanted that, and he wanted to do it for himself, and he wanted to do it immediately. You get into all sorts of mind games. But I guess, Stuart, the answer is it was not necessary. And that's why the question, that question was passed through the Situation Room. It was passed to Robert Kennedy. He discussed that point with several people, and none of the people he was talking to quite understood why he was asking it because it made no sense. Um, he had already been sworn in. He had already taken his oath of office uh, as vice president, which is the same oath of office you take as president. So I don't know if that, it's, it was meaningless. And when you get into, if you do read Surprise Attack, I go into great length about the fact that basically Everything that Johnson did that day, we'll talk about it more here, was out of line. He didn't do anything that he was supposed to do, and he did everything that he wasn't supposed to do. Uh, and that after a certain point, that does get a little bit suspicious because you have to start asking yourself how badly he could have misunderstood what he was supposed to be doing. And I have to admit to all of you that when I wrote Someone Would Have Talked, and over the years when I presented on this, this was a major factor in raising my own suspicions about Johnson's free knowledge and involvement. Yeah. Unfortunately, after I had gone further in time and looked at the performance of the vice president in various events over the years, and as we'll discuss today, Johnson's failure is not nearly as significant as you would suppose it to be, because the vice presidents, both during Reagan's shooting and on that, on November, I'm sorry, on 9/11, failed almost as dramatically as Johnson did. Uh, I think Johnson probably still leads the pack, but we'll get to that as as we go on. So, thank you, Larry. One more. Uh, we've got a question from Malcolm Blunt. Hello, Malcolm. Hello, Larry. Can you hear, Larry? I uh, can hear Malcolm just you barely. Could? Excellent. Can just barely. Yeah, that sounds like it. Uh, I just wondered what your interpretation of the DEFCON level is for um, the 22nd of November, 63. Do you see any uh, any significance in the fact that it hardly moved? Sure. There is an, an interesting thing, and again, which which I didn't fully realize myself for a long time, is that the Secretary of Defense determines the overall DEFCON level, and then the DEFCON level is communicated out through the National Military Command Center. But that, the individual, what are called the numbered commands, military commands, that would be the Army in Europe, the Navy in the Atlantic, the Navy in the Pacific, the Strategic Air Command, they have the authority to raise their own DEFCON levels at their discretion. Uh, and there are a number of intermediate steps. So even if, if I go from DEFCON 4 to DEFCON 3, it is legally permissible for the Pacific commander to move to a higher level of readiness, which he actually did on November 22nd. 
twenty second. Um, he, we now know that he actually uh, alerted his nuclear weapons uh, and readied his nuclear weapons, including uh, sea launch nukes. Not not necessarily the submarine ballistic missiles, but uh, shipborne nuclear weapons uh, off Korea and off China. He had the authority to do that. Basically, that's a, a command decision. And what it really means is those commanders who are closest to the enemy are given the authority to go to a higher level of readiness. They can't bump the overall level. They can bump their own force readiness. Um, SAC clearly went to a ha higher level of readiness. They took their IB ICBMs up to launch state which is normally something that you find associated with DEF CON too. Um, so I guess general answer to the question, what McNamara did as Secretary of Defense was pretty much in line with conditions of the time. What the field commanders did was uh, a higher level of readiness, questionable or not questionable, nothing illegal about it, let's put it that way. And given the fact that they're on, they were only one year out of the Cuban Missile Crisis, um, probably not that unexpected. Uh, quite frankly, and we'll get to that in a minute, um, Nat McNamara might well have gone to a higher level himself. Uh, he, he showed a great deal of restraint by holding where he did, in my view. So. Another lengthy answer to a brief question, sorry. <laughs> Thank you, Larry. All right, if that's it, then we'll go on. Let's go to the next slide. And so let's start with the Cuban Missile Crisis. Um,
what does that tell you? Well, for one thing, it tells you that they weren't good before and then and bad before and then suddenly good afterwards. Yeah, exactly. They were just poor all the way through. Um, terrible communications after the fact. Uh, if you look at the Secret Service in Dallas, all this, all this trouble is an effort and money is spent to set up this, this highly secure chain of communications going all the way from the president back to Washington, D.C., to the Situation Room, to SAC, to everybody else, and the Secret Service is in charge of it. They brought along the White House communication staff to run it, but these are the guys that control it and are holding the radio telephones in their hands. And for those of you who have studied it, did those radio telephones get used after the assassination? And almost 98% of the time, no, they did not. Everybody went into the hospital at Parkland, and everybody started running around taking over the hospital telephone system, jacking phones together. The whole thing, that's not how it's supposed to work. For one thing, none of those lines are secure. There's no ability to make them secure. So what you should have done, of course, if you were the Secret Service, was immediately run over and grab the vice president, who is now likely to be president, and certainly is commander-in-chief acting, and put a telephone in his hand and it has secure voice capability and dial them up to the National Military Command Center or SAC. Assuming that he's in self, in panic mode because he's been shot, you do it for him, one of his military aides does it for him, somebody does it for him, because this is the guy that's in control. And the way the protocol runs is you've got 15 minutes after an, uh, an incident like this and after 15 minutes, the Russian ICMs are already impacting. So by the time they got to the hospital, we're behind the curve anyway. So the, for those of all of you who have started study what happened at Parkland, is this what happened? Hmm. What I expected to hear was a resounding no. Well, it certainly wasn't operating properly, no. <laughs> no, not at all. Either, either of these guys did not understand what they were supposed to be doing. Uh, you know, you, you've got to be asking why they, why you would have gone to all the trouble to do this and then not use it. Even the Secret Service personnel themselves were calling out of the hospital rather than on their own network. Okay, so this is not good at all. Protection. All right, this is 1963. <coughs> The ground rule in 1963 at the height of the Cold War is that what you're going to expect if the Russians decided to preemptively strike the United States is you're, you're going to expect decapitation, which means the Russians are smart enough to take out the President, the Secretary of Defense, and everybody in the higher levels of command structure so that nobody can issue those commands and there's no retaliation, and they win. So, what would you expect if the president is shot in Dallas? Somebody is immediately going to be coming after the vice president. So what kind of protection did they provide for the vice president and the new president at Parkland? Well, I think Youngblood acted in the car, didn't he? But uh, after that... Is there a, mil is there a military car cordoned around the hospital? Are there any guys with automatic weapons in the hall? No, you got like three Secret Service guys with pistols, and they're punching out people that try to get into the emergency room. <laughs> now, that's all well and good, except if this were really an attack, and a Russian spaznets unit mm. is about to take out the vice president, we'd be over and done. So, not to be too dramatic about the whole thing, no, they didn't provide any kind of effective security at the hospital. What about the airplane? What about Air Force One? Any military there? Any air cover there? Anything to prevent oh, a private plane from being flying right over and crashing into Air Force One? No. None at all. No, no security for the aircraft. Now, 
we'll get to that in a minute, but again, I was suspicious of this. This is this is terrible. This is no either nobody knows their job or nobody is able to do their job under stress. So at this point in time you have to say this is suspicious because it really is bad. Okay, White House Situation Room. When you give a C, the reason I do that is the whole reason the Situation Room is there is because it's to serve as the hub of communication to the National Security Council members within the government, which means they're supposed to be there and they're supposed to be in touch with matters through all of the watch officers and the communications that are unique um, were they there? You've all studied this? What was going on in that day in 1963? Where, where, where was the Secretary of Defense? Where, was, where were all these people? The Secretary of Defense, fortunately, was at the Pentagon. Everybody else was either wandering around Washington or watching television in their office. <laughs> None of them went to the Situation Room and stayed in the Situation Room and attempted to participate in any meaningful manner in a national security response. Now, as we look a little bit further and we look at affairs in 1981, as it turns out, that may not have been a bad deal because if they had all assembled where they should have, they might have started fighting with each other and made it even worse, like Hagen. <laughs> Weinberger did, but that's another, we'll get there in a minute. <laughs> Finally, National Command Authority, was there anybody that stepped up on this whole day and did anything like they were supposed to? And the answer is the Secretary of Defense. McNamara did stay at the Pentagon for a good while. He did call the Joint Chiefs together and advise them of the situation. He did go to the National Military Command Center and ensure that alerts and DEF CON messages were issued. Now, I make the argument, and to go back to Malcolm's point, is that he was far too slow in doing it. If this had been a real attack, it would have been all over because you would have had about four minutes to a sub-launch missile hitting the National Military Command Center. But at least he generally did what he was supposed to, even if it wasn't quickly enough. In terms of command and control, uh, I'm probably being generous there. Johnson should really get an F. I gave him the D. Uh, Johnson showed no evidence of knowing what a president's supposed to do in a crisis. Uh, he showed no indication. There's, there's no evidence anywhere, and if it, if it exists, it would be nice to see it because it would make it look better than it looks at this stage. There's no evidence that Johnson tried to re assume the role of commander-in-chief. As a matter of fact, I asked the fellow I interviewed who had been part of this system, the continuity of government system, and who had been in one of the communications hubs for secure voice communications that was in between the White House and Air Force One and SAC. And I basically asked him, I said, you know, I cannot believe that there was no secure voice communications available to Johnson. I can't believe that Johnson totally failed to contact any of these people. So I want you to go on record and tell me. And he said, well, I won't go on record, but no, he didn't. <laughs> Johnson totally I'm not sure exactly what the right word was. Johnson totally failed to assume commander-in-chief duties, and the feeling was that he was doing it intentionally, that he, he was not up to it mentally or did not have sufficient character, but he didn't do it. Now, this sounds pretty sus suspicious, doesn't it? Yes. It would sound really suspicious in isolation until we see what our next two presidents or vice presidents did in 1981 and 2001, and generally speaking, it's just as bad. But, so, one of the things after looking at it, I did come to the conclusion is Johnson had had no preparation, no training. Johnson did not know what the PSYOP was. Johnson had no idea what the nuclear bomb case had in it. 
There were no training exercises. There were there had been no the vice presidents were not allowed to participate in any nuclear readiness exercises. Uh, as a matter of fact, it's unclear whether there were any such things then. Today there are. Later on there were. There's just no sign that any of these people ever practiced what the protocols really were. They're, that that they ran through even the basic mechanics of how to respond. There's no sign that Johnson's military aides knew what their role should have been. When you look back at it, it's amazing that nobody on Air Force One, that this is great, nobody on Air Force One, none of the three military aides that were on the plane tried to engage with him and tell them he, that he should be in, con in communication with SAC. Uh, it took considerable time once he got on to Air Force One for him to be told that he even had access to telephones. And it was only when he saw one of the Secret Service officers using a telephone and asked them that they said, oh, yes, Mr. President, we actually have phones on this airplane, and you can call people if you wanted to. Um, <laughs> that's insane, but that's what appears to have happened. So, all in all, the national security response on, in 1963 was pretty darn bad. Uh, and that gives us our kind of basic benchmark to see is it pretty bad in isolation, singularly bad, suspiciously bad, or is this the way it goes? Uh, questions at this point? Larry? Barry Keane? Uh, yes. Hi. Um, I think there's one saving grace from all of this. It's probably a good, idea, a good thing to notice that perhaps the Soviet Union were unaware of the fact that the U.S. command structure had actually